we will receive uh, Amancio uh, Busa uh, right on the main stage and on the other stage we will receive uh, Mike Amundsen for building ready PIs. On the other session, we will have Aaron Pariki for the state of OAuth. We have a first workshop about the practical guide for API management for GraphQL. And we have a first run table, which is dealing with data sovereignty as you scale across regions. So you can decide if you stay in this room or if you go in the sessions room, right? And we on the main stage, we will have uh, in like a few seconds, we will have Amancio Buza uh, coming. So let's begin. So I'm super excited to uh, talk today at the API Days interface and especially excited about one topic that I really care about, and that's API products, building API products to really, um, that really customers love and also your organizations love because that's um, mostly or often quite uh, forgotten. So, but uh, who am I? So my name is Amantio. I'm the co-author of API product management, and that was or well, let's say the backstory, it was kind of a need because several years ago we started with the, we had the mandate to uh, create business value with APIs and then we uncovered slowly our API products, but there was no approach how to approach API as a product. So we had to do a lot of research, a lot of reading, and then we somehow developed uh, some methods and tools that helped us to create successful API products and that's why we share also our insights and collaborate on it with, uh, with, uh, with the API community, right? And I also work as a principal IT consultant, uh, helping uh, organizations with all APIs or API products, and besides that, also with uh, machine learning and sorts of things. And I also advise API-first startups, some of them. And since last Friday, I'm also a homeowner of a condo, and that brings me uh, to this to what happened to me on Saturday, what I experienced there, which has uh, relates to API products. So um, we have a new condo. We are going to move and we need to yeah, organize all the stuff, needs new furniture. So last Saturday we went to it, IKEA. Um, and that's something or a place that I really love because it gives a lot of inspiration how to uh, fill in the rooms. Right? And what I, we really looked for was yeah, organize our cellar, all the stuff, put it there, Organize, uh, being organized, and also still getting uh, or access those things. And we uh, visited almost five furniture stores, and usually it looks like this. So uh, just some stairs or some some chairs, some furniture, one by one, and that's what uh, the furniture stores how they present the furniture. IKEA does it a little bit different. So what they really showed me is not only just furniture but really in a context. So what you see here is really what I was looking for, shelves to be really taught to become organized. And that's what IKEA does, really presents what you can become. And I see here clearly, okay, I have some, some storages, some, some shelves, and I can really also access it. You can't imagine how, my, how many times I just buy the same tools over and over again, put it somewhere, it's out of sight, forgotten, so I have to buy it uh, another time. So this will help me. Also, a table which you can lift up. If you don't need it, lift it down. If you need a workplace, so my wife or me, we can repair stuff, create our own furniture, and so on and so on. And that's what most companies actually do. It's really, they just try to sell the thing. And if you uh, know the, the, the computer game Super Mario and you happen to find a, a fire flower, uh, why do you need to, to catch a fire flower? And because it's just, a thousand points, but it doesn't help you to, to, to save the princess, right? And that's actually what the customers buy. They don't buy the thing, they really buy what they become. And with the fire flower, you become the fire super Mario. That means you can kill enemies without risking your life. So that makes it easier to save the princess in the end. And what's the API here in this game? So the API, and that's really an important idea, is really the interface to really access this value proposition. So the interface to, to shoot the balls to the enemies. And that's really a basic idea uh, or basic fundamental idea for API products. So the API is not the interface to backend or exposing backends. It's really about the interface to value proposition. So now you might uh, ask, okay, what is an API product then? If it's just an interface to value proposition, so it's a complete package. So an API product is really about a digital product offered as a service because you can't just package an API, install it somewhere at the customer. You really have to 
provided as a service with SLAs, with availability and all these kind of things. And also it needs to provide value to a certain group of people, that's your customers, but also don't forget it needs also to provide value to the organization because if it doesn't provide value, then it's just a, a waste of money and the, the organization should uh, invest their resources to uh, somewhere else. That's the basic principle of API product management. So you have really these three, three things. Um, I mean, API product management, in the end, it's product management, and it's about mitigating risks. So the risk of not building something what the customer wants, not building something that helps the organization. So no uh, uh, business value, no uh, direct or uh, indirect uh, monetization, and also something that you can't even build. And I think in this conference, there's a lot of talk about uh, the feasibility, how you can build better APIs in a better way. So I will talk about the first two things. So how to find really desirable API products and how to make sure that also your organization loves them because it provides the right value um, to the organization. So let's start with the first thing, the desirability or does the customer really want it? And here I want to show you um, one project that was involved last year uh, for an NGO. So the NGO here provides an assisted transport to people in need. So for instance, elderly people who can't use a public transport or who have a broken leg, can't use public transport or taxis to, to cumbersome to get to the medical appointment and uh, to get healing. So um, these customers, they call the, the NGO uh, to get the driver that will uh, and drive them to the medical appointment or to the doctor. And the association will coordinate the volunteers, define, okay, who of the volunteers will uh, drive uh, this customer. And then the driver will drive the, the customer to the doctor, and then he has to fill out the report. That means, okay, how, was, how much was the distance uh, from the customer's home to the doctor and back again, how much time it, uh, it costed to get just reimbursement, for instance, for, for gasoline, because they don't get a payment, they got just reimbursement for their expenses. And then the, uh, the association takes all these reports, puts it into, a, uh, yeah, into an application system uh, just for the financial and booking uh, stuff, which is then uh, provided by the, by the agency, agency. So that agency is providing this, uh, this application. And um, we wanted to improve this, uh, uh, this whole thing. And we did a design sprint to really identify the key pain points. And what we found out is the drivers, they have to fill out several forms, depending if the customer is paying cash or the customer is uh, uh, paying by a bill. And they have to collect all the reports for all the transport or drives they are doing and then send it to the, to the association uh, each month. And there, of course, these employees are over flooded with uh, reports. They have to fill it into the system manually. And this is also really pain point. So we wanted to improve that. And what we did was we provided or created a mobile app for the, for the drivers, which just uh, collected in background distance and also time used and submitted it automatically or entered in, it in automatically into, the, into this uh, uh, booking system uh, via API. So no report was needed. So the volunteers were happy because they just want to have a purpose, help people uh, in need. And also the association doesn't want just to um, take reports, fill it into uh, a system. They want also to create value uh, to people in need. And we automated this process, so report was gone, and this created a really nice business value. But uh, um, we are also asked ourselves, can we do more? I mean, this is just about optimization of a, of a process. And interestingly, um, Uber Health uh, provides some quite inform uh, interesting information, like um, there are 3.6 million Americans who miss the medical appointments each year due to lack of reliable transportation. And that's a huge thing, such that Uber even has, a, has its own product. And uh, I just... Uh, um, did some, some number crunching. So how would that look like in Switzerland? So there are 3.6 million uh, uh, missed appointments in the US. In Switzerland, we have, uh, yeah, we have less population, but that means we have 85,000 uh, uh, missed appointments. 
And we, if we involve the cost of the medical doctor, we can say, okay, the health organization in Switzerland, they lose around 11.5 million each, each year because just of missed uh, appointments. That's an opportunity, opportunity actually. So we went back to the board, looked at the stakeholders, who thought, okay, Uber Health is uh, taking health organizations into account. That's also taking health organizations into account. What can we do then? So what if we can provide an API product to the health organizations? With that, they can order the, the drives or the transport for their patients. So we can, all of the time, we can charge completely new customers. So we got a new customer, a new market, and we can uh, uh, internally, we can uh, provide our service for free to the drivers and also the OCS association. And also the patients, they don't have to um, or the transport, it's really the, the health organizations who do all the organization and get the value because about this uh, 11.5 million dollars. Uh, uh, but just a disclaimer, this actually doesn't work in Switzerland. Uh, um, just for, for regulation purposes, also Swiss public transport is super reliable. So uh, uh, people in Switzerland even uh, um, <coughs> Uh, shout out if, uh, if the transport is just one minute late. So it's uh, it's an uh, apocalyptic uh, situation if it's one minute late. So it's not really working citizen, but probably in another country, who knows. Um, but this looks quite simple, right? You have the revenue model, so you have found a new customer, you identified an API product, but how do you get there? And um, what we um, found or research is a really nice uh, value proposition canvas from Alex Osterwalder, which complements the business model canvas. And we adapted it or put it into the context of APIs. And that's what comes out. So we have on the right side, really the customer profile. So what does he want to get done? What are his problems? And on the left side, the value proposition interface map, which uh, um, represents our, our organizations, what assets do you have, and how can we provide value to the customer? And it's really about how, not about filling uh, the canvas, just uh, isolated like a form. It's really about how these little uh, canvas really talk to each other and how they are connected. So you start typically with uh, with the customer first. Uh, you see here the numbers. So who is the actual the customer? And you see in the example before with the NGO, it completely changes the game depending on who you define as a customer. So. Uh, is it the NGO, the association, or is it the healthcare organizations? And then the second step, you really go uh, towards the, the organizations. What are the assets that you can reuse and how you can you formulate the value proposition uh, and an API? And uh, let me just uh, do the, the example. So here, the customer profile. So what you have to do is um, identify the customer. Here, you have to really uh, to be clear. Uh, and also, this is usually it's a quite a, huge discussion if you do a workshop with several stakeholders, who is actually the customers. And uh, it's always a uh, discussion about customers and developers or developers customers or are they users and so on. So what you have to do, you should just list the, uh, the stakeholders and show the revenue model, not in the sense who pays who, but how the values flow. So who provides value to whom, what does he get back? And then play around with that. You can also leverage uh, existing B2B uh, uh, partnerships or ecosystems to, to have a start. And then you identify the pains to get the jobs done and you need really to validate those, uh, uh, those assumptions. If you don't validate, it's really not about product management because product management is really about validating things, mitigating the risks so you know that you really build something that the customers really want. And then you go over to the value proposition interface map. There you start listing all the data sources, applications, business processes, third APIs, even internal APIs that you could potentially use to really create a value. Then you define the, create, uh, the pain relievers. How you, there you define how you want to, um, to relieve the pains of the customers and not um, what you want to do. So in the, in, the, in, the, in the case of the of the NGO, so it was, um, so we defined as a customer, the healthcare organizations, they wanted or their job to get done was healing the patients 
during the appointment. And that problem was the, the patients don't show up or even delay the, the appointments of other, uh, of other customers. And what we have, uh, or what the NGO had, was really an assisted transport infrastructure. So a huge pool of volunteers with cars who are, uh, who are eager to help others and drive people to their medical appointments, and also a system where you can book and coordinate uh, this kind of transports. And what the value proposition to the healthcare organization could be it was really like a, a ready to order patient transport. <clears throat> so that means the healthcare organizations get an API where they can order the transport. And that really changes uh, uh, the picture if you take just the association of customers because they're just caring about reports, about distances and time the drivers are uh, um, driving. But healthcare organizations, they want the transport ordered and really have it reliable. And then from this value proposition, having this patient transport, you can define or derive an API, in this case, transport API, which reflects somewhat the value proposition. And this looks yeah, maybe uh, quite simple. It's quite a simple example, but in real life, it really looks like this, if you are prepared. Um, so a lot of ideas about who actually the customers are, what are their pains, and then a huge list of potential assets that could be relevant, and then also uh, value propositions. And what in real life really happens is, um, first of all, you document what uh, the customer is and what their pain is. You can validate it. And you can really, from the value proposition, you can really identify, okay, what's actually a minimum viable product? Something that you can really build fast to create value to potential customer. And then build from there really the whole API product roadmap to really go from value proposition to value proposition to create even more value, provide you more uh, value to, to the customer. And then for instance, the yellows, uh, yellow stickers, they were just the APIs that uh, you could uh, implement to, uh, to create or uh, um, realize those value propositions. So what this customer in this example really got was also a huge API portfolio that could put it into the roadmap, what they can build over the next period of time. So the, a the VPI canvas really helps to validate the problem solutions bit, really to find something that really customers really desire. And that's the first delivery of, of this talk. So building API products that customers really love, but what about API products that also organizations love? And here we come to the uh, second thing, viability. So should the organization actually build it? It could be that it provides value to customer, but it could be that it doesn't provide value to organizations. For instance, it's not on strategy, it's too costly, or not a, a core competence of the company. And what we uh, um, used or um, were inspired from the, the, the Lean Canvas, so we adopted it to, to an API product canvas. And here you see uh, uh, canvas like uh, who's actually the customer, the problem, what's the value proposition solution, and so on. And this is really now becoming, after the problem solution fit, we go to the product market fit. So you try to um, evolve the problem solution fit into a product that really also creates value to the organization. And here it's really nice about the VPI cameras. So it really synergizes really well with API product cameras. So here the orange things, that's really what you can take from the VPI cameras. You can really fill it in there. So we can take over who's actually the customer, what are the problems or the pains, what is, are the pain relievers and the assets to formulate the value proposition, and the APIs are the, the solution. And then you have just to fill out the rest of the canvas. And uh, the next thing would be the business goals. And that's not actually the business goals of the API product itself in, in the sense of uh, just making money or monetize the API. So it's really about connecting the API product with a corporate strategy. So how can the API product really support the organization in strategy? And with that, you really show the benefit to the organizations, why you should really build it. And usually this is also gets the buy-in of the management to really get the money to build it. Or at least um, you get less resistance. <clears throat> then um, you uh, can fill in the, the the key metrics, so the key KPIs. 
And here it's really important that, uh, um, I mean, there are a lot of um, nonsense KPIs, like number of cores of APIs and so on. Here you have really to do a final KPI that really uh, reflects or represents how well you deliver on, the, on your value proposition. And in, in the sense or in the case of uh, this uh, um, transport management of the NGO, it's really about the number or the percentage of missed uh, appointments. So because the healthcare organization is about or is interested in uh, reducing the number of uh, missed appointments and you have somehow to measure it. And you have to, sometimes you have to be quite creative or make assumptions to really get out some certain uh, number or uh, a measurement. And the goal really is about, not about, uh, let's say, to get a bonus or something like that. So it's really about uh, the KPI should really provide you information how you can improve the API product in the next iteration. <clears throat> and uh, as a takeaway, um, be like uh, IKEA. So use your assets and formulate with those assets value propositions. And for that, you have really to first understand why is the customer coming to you? What is he really searching? So in the case of IKEA and me, I was looking for uh, to be, become organized in the seller that I can put my stuff, but also I find it really easy. And IKEA showed me what they can provide to me to really organize my seller in my, in my new condo. And there's a basic, uh, really fundamental idea that you have to see APIs, not just as about, about exposing um, backend applications. So it's really about exposing uh, value propositions. So, I mean, you can build systems API that connect uh, backends. You can build process APIs to um, make uh, um, process or business process of your organization accessible, but then create APIs that are really an interface to value proposition. Value proposition. And that's really what uh, an API product in the end uh, can become. And then as a second uh, takeaway, so API products is really um, a digital product offered as a service that provides value to, you, uh, to a group of people and your organizations. You also, you have to really to make this kind of connection between something that creates value to customer and also uh, the benefits for the organization. And then as a, the VPI canvas, it's really a tool to really to help you um, to find this problem solution fit, to help you really to find an API product that is desirable. And the API product canvas is something that helps you really to uh, um, connect it to the corporate strategy. So with the business goals also um, to communicate it within the organizations, um, why you should build it and why, why it's really relevant for the organization. So really kind of a communication instrument. And you call, uh, repeat it over and over again, uh, iterate on it to even create more value. And that's the whole thing about building API products that uh, customers and your organizations love. Thank you very much, Amancio. In 30 seconds before next speaker, maybe question we've seen, uh, should we treat all APIs as product in our organization, even if we have hundreds? Um, there are specific benefits if you treat everything as a uh, as a product because um, you don't just create APIs because uh, in the past you always thought, okay, let's build it, let's build APIs and people will use it. Usually that doesn't happen. So think about who can use it, who is interested in it and then build it with these customers in mind. So internally also as externally. Thank you very much, Amancio, for this question. Uh, and now, uh, as the next speaker, uh, someone we're really glad to have uh, uh, at APIA's interface, uh, it's Maria Kessler, a Senior Program Manager and Digital Partnerships at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and to talk about the Met, Art, API, and, and Global Access. So we'll have Maria uh, joining on the stage. And thank you, Armand, thank you very much, Amancio, for providing this talk on, um, uh, on APIs as product. Yeah. Already some, some good feedbacks. Hi, Maria. So Hi. Uh, yeah, hope you're doing well. Uh, people are expecting your talk. Uh, so I hope you're um, yeah, you're as excited as us to, to deliver it. Uh, and yes, I invite you to share the screen. Uh, and so we can uh, uh, we can enjoy uh, with all the community what you have to share with us. Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to say hello. Um, Thank you for your time. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. Um, 
My name is Maria Kessler and I'm from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, let's see, are you not seeing my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. You can put it full screen to see like- Yes, you can see okay. That's perfect. So um, I just wanna say thank you for your time today. Um, let's go ahead and get started since I'm having some te technical difficulties in the beginning. So I wanna start first with the Met's mission. Our mission is to collect, study, conserve, and present significant works of art across all times and cultures. Um, it's to connect people to creativity, knowledge, and ideas. And that connection to creativity, knowledge, and ideas is really at the very heart of my API presentation here today. Now, before we get totally started, I know that many of you have heard about the Metropolitan Museum of Art and I hope that many have been able to visit, but I wanna share just a few things that make the Met special to me. First of all, we're located in New York City's Center Park. We have gorgeous architectural features throughout the building. We have numerous galleries. Here's the Temple of Dendur and also the Greek and Roman sculpture court. And we've been dedicated to education from our very beginning. So you have a then and a now image showing here. But at the very heart of the Metropolitan Museum is our encyclopedic collection, which spans over 5,000 years of art and culture from across the globe. So an encyclopedic collection really just means we have a huge range of objects in our collection. So it starts with, you know, um, Greek and Roman statues, vessels of classical mythology. We have many representations of Buddha and Buddhist deities. We have furniture, we have period rooms, we have many depictions of animals, we have still life, we have satire. We have petrified bread and we have mummies from ancient Egypt. We also have artifacts of historical events and depictions of historical events. And of course, we have the human figure depicted in all matter of materials. So we have over 1.5 million art objects in our collection. And if you are to visit, only 4% of that collection is viewable in our galleries. We have nearly half a million art objects online with 670,000 associated images. But if we're to fulfill our mission to connect people to creativity, knowledge, and ideas, if we're gonna be a museum of the world, about the world and for the world, we need to make our collection more accessible. We want our collection to be as accessible as possible to the 4.3 billion internet connected people on the planet. And really to do that, we needed to put together our open access program and an API so that we had accessibility as well as reach. So our open access program is really uh, the release of public domain images and data under CC0 license. And the CC0 license is really a notice waiving all of our copyright claims to these works. So we, we created our open access program and launched it in early 2017. And with that, we had about 375,000 art objects. And this is a great start. It was a huge, massive content, and it was available at metmuseum.org or in a CSV file. But it wasn't that accessible. You had to go to our website and download one image or one file at a time, or you could use our CSV file, which is great. That's a great first start. But if we were going to work with partnerships and platforms, we really knew that an API was our solution. So in 2018, we started to build our API. We knew what we wanted to launch with, and we knew the general sense of the architecture that we needed, but we had an opportunity to work with Google Arts and Culture, and they provided us with a real world use case. So Google Arts and Culture um, is a platform for museum collections all over the world. And we had been working with them for over seven years but we had only managed to upload about 700 images. So it was in both of our best interests to work with them. So we put together the basic schema to upload our open access collection onto our 
onto their platform using our API. So when we launched our API, they launched the integration of our API and they went from 700 images to over 200,000 images in one night. So the launch of our API was in late 2018 and we launched with over 205,000 distinct art objects with over 406,000 associated images. Some images actually have numerous, um, some art objects have numerous images with them. We also were certain to make um, all of our uh, data files available, both under CC0, our public domain works, as well as our copyrighted works. For, it, for us, this was a really pivotal, pivotal moment because we now had a mass of content and we had the pipeline, we had the means to work with other partnerships and platforms to reach those global audiences um, because we had the API and we knew that we had a successful integration in working with Google Arts and Culture. We thought we would let the dust settle for just a moment. We also had in the background a subject keyword data set that we were working on, and we wanted to upload that to the API. We also had a few partners that we wanted to integrate the API with. We were just gonna take our time, but that didn't really happen because just a few weeks later, Microsoft approached us with the opportunity to experiment with artificial intelligence. So we thought this was a great idea. Let's explore uh, with AI the data sets that we already had, and let's put in that subject keyword data set and see what would happen. So we were game for that. And uh, we also had the opportunity to ask some partners at MIT to join us, because why not add in a few great academic minds just to keep us honest? So the goal of this collaboration was to use AI, our API, and this new subject keyword data set, and to make new connections, to see what new connections could be made for global audiences, connecting them to art. So after a two-day hackathon, and then a few weeks of prototype work, we actually had a reveal event at the Met. And what you're seeing here are some of the prototypes that we revealed. The two images on the left are from Gen Studio. Gen Studio is a generative adversarial network project that took two pieces of art from different times and different geographies and let the computers interpolate what might have been in between using common attributes. So that was just fascinating. On the right, you see an application called Storyteller App where a person would talk into a microphone and then uh, artworks were generated up on the screen in one of 10 languages. A few more uh, prototypes. We had a My Met story, which was based on immigrant, um, sorry, Instagram images that were paired with a Met image. Or below that is um, artwork of the day, which used open source historical data and then paired that with a Met image as well. On the right, what you're seeing is a Wikipedia depiction, art depiction game. So we asked a Wikipedian to also join us in this collaborative mix, and they generated um, subject keywords. And then the Wikipedian said, ah, oh, subject keywords are you know, only X percent uh, valid. So let's crowdsource uh, the Wikipedian uh, community and verify those uh, keywords. So for us, this was great because we got clear validation in a simple yes or no, and we got to bring those subject keywords back into the Mac collection. For us, this was a great opportunity. First of all, we had researchers, data scientists, Wikipedians, Met staff, um, everyone was involved and we were creating all this range of prototypes and that would connect people to art in different ways. So that was absolutely fantastic. We were very pleased with this collaboration. Um, we were even luckier when not too much longer later, another group from Microsoft also uh, approached us and they said, hey, we have an idea. We'd like to use AI to explore your uh, collection um, 
regarding search. And we worked with them and collaborated on a search proof of concept called Art Explorer. And what this did is it used cognitive as well as visual search to explore the API and, and the open access images in the collection. So you can start with Washington crossing the Delaware and within one or two clicks, you could get to a statue of Minnehaha created by the sculptress Edmonia Lewis, who is one of the very first women of international claim. And she was also of African-American and Native American descent. So for us to go from Washington to Edmonia Lewis it was just astounding. And uh, we really love this concept and we'd like to see more done with it. Um, also, as part of this, it did spawn a Bing visual search skill, which is available and used today by developers. So shifting gears just a little bit, um, another use of our API was with Pinterest, and this was more about a process. Um, similar to Google Arts and Culture, uh, Pinterest is a creative community. It's a different type of community, but we had been uploading images uh, five a week, you know, 20 a month, something like that. But using our API and working with Pinterest, we were able to develop a process that lets us batch upload to their site. So we could do batches of 100 to 1,000. And when we did our first upload last summer, we uploaded about 2,000 images in one shot. And we were super, super excited because of course it generated a ton of traffic to the pins and it brought referral traffic back to the Met. So we've done a few more uploads and we have this process in play now. And so it's just another example of how to use the API as a process. So we do collaborate with uh, academics and universities, et cetera, that is at the core of our mission. And, um, you know, it, it's been interesting because in the past, it's mostly been art history. And all of a sudden, we are working with university students in big data and technology. So last fall, we worked with a group from Parsons School of Design in their data visualization class. And they approached us. We said, yes, use our API. Yes, we're happy to collaborate. So we met with them and we told them a few of the quirks about our data. And then we met with them during the midterms and then the finals. And we were so delighted with what we saw from these students. Um, here you're seeing a representation of armor and weaponry across time and geography. But also um, one of the students did a landscape generator that was fascinating that looked at all the landscape paintings across the Mets collection, which was enormous. And then we also had a student that was particularly interested in religious art and tying religious art back to the specific stories of the Catholic Rosary. Again, this was a real opportunity for us in many ways. First of all, we got first-hand feedback from the students. A couple of the students uh, wanted to use uh, depictions of female artists or to look into uh, female artists. We didn't have that information in our API. So what we did is we've, we've since added it and we now have um, a way to sort the information so that you could uh, select um, the where, where gender is uh, distinguished as an artist identified as female. And so you can actually sort on that particular data. But it's that feedback that we got from the students that was so important. Look, when we launched our API, we made it public. There was no barrier, no key. Um, and we did this on purpose because we wanted people to experiment with our open access collection. We wanted people to connect uh, to knowledge, creativity, and ideas. That was, that's part of our mission. Um, so, you know, this was a great collaboration for us. We also worked with, um, or, you know, a couple of groups in the data science community as well. Um, we worked with the University of Virginia 
um, they their data science institute and they built an AI image detection model that was fascinating. And then we also worked with a group from Visipedia and um, some colleagues at New York Cornell, and they arranged a Kaggle competition that looked that used machine learning, looking at fine grain attributes in an artwork and whether or not you could predict when that artwork was created and where it was from. Um, so that's actually on TensorFlow and very fascinating uh, competition. And it just showed you um, the, the data sciences, scientists were absolutely excited to be working with the Met Collection instead of uh, scientific uh, cells and widgets, et cetera. Um, again, these were all different uh, types of projects, but every time we collaborated with these different groups, they gave us incredible feedback. And because of their feedback, we've enhanced our API in different ways. Um, really in the past couple of months, we listened to all the feedback we were getting and we realized we needed to add in a few controlled vocabularies. So we just recently added Getty Research Institute's union list of artist names, as well as the art and architecture thesaurus. We've also added Wikidata IDs. Now, these are incredibly important um, things to add to our API because it allows our collection to be intermingled with other collections that also have these controlled vocabularies. Also, the Wikidata IDs open us up to one of the largest shared platforms in the planet as well. And uh, it's machine accessible through the Wikidata IDs as well as translatable into over 80 active languages. So here's another example of an organization that approached us right after we launched our API. They came to us and they asked for just the information that was in our Egyptian curatorial department. And we didn't have that at the start, but we thought, oh, well, if they need it, someone else might need it. And so we now have an endpoint by department as well. And as you can see, we're now part of one of four different uh, collections that are on the Clio site so that researchers and students can you know, access this information as a one-stop shop. We also have an integration of our API with Creative Commons. Their main mission is to make all public domain images as accessible as possible. And of course, we're in total alignment with that. So we like API integrations like this one. And then I just wanted to review our API. It's at metmuseum.github.io. And we have lots of different ways that you can sort this information and filter it and use different endpoints. Um, here are just a few. Um, and I just want to say again how important the partnership feedback, the public feedback has been and how we're absolutely enhancing our API as we're going. We really do believe that we have a unique API in our field. Um, it's because we, we have an engaged team that is listening, that is collaborating, that is enhancing this from, uh, on a periodic basis, but also our information is updated on a nightly basis as well. So, here we are at the Met again, and I can really seriously tell you that we could not have imagined all these different projects and programs and um, interactions that would have been possible under our open access program, but we were absolutely certain that an API was the pipeline to that accessibility, that an API was the launch pad for this, and it certainly has has been. It's been a wild, wonderful ride with all these different projects. Um, so we're very, very pleased. Um, I also want to say I'm honored to be part of API Days, and I'm honored to share the Met API story with you. And I truly hope that some of the ideas shared here will connect us to knowledge, creativity, and ideas for centuries to come. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. Thank you. Uh, some uh, we have a little bit of time for uh, one or two questions. Uh, one question we've seen is about um, 
what's what's the original team? Is it a team of technical people who learn who has been hired and and who learn about museums and and you know collaboration uh, to build that program or or it was the opposite like it was people who know new art who knew like uh, uh, you know collections that were able to uh, who learn about APIs and to to uh, to manage this uh, open access program. So we're very fortunate because we have. Um, developers, our lead developer on this actually has worked in the museum environment for a while. So it, it's a little bit of both. Um, he's a developer. He understands and he used architecture that was, you know, um, sustainable for our API. We use a RESTful. I, I'm not a technology, but we use the RESTful um, program. And then um, he also understands our data and understands the intricacies and the the things that are um, different about the little quirks about our data as well. Yeah, so it was important because uh, Mari Papandiek showed us that the people aspect is extremely important in even into a let's say a technical technological program. Uh, so yeah, so this is why I wanted also. Uh, uh, to, to put a question. Uh, so what, what's your next project? What are you working on and where the community can help you today? So um, one of the things that I'm interested in, of course, we want more. Um, we do have a few more enhancements that we want to add to our API. Uh, one of the feedbacks that we had was, you know, can we get gallery numbers? Because we have maps, we have uh, different areas that have different air, um, art collections. So we'll probably add the gallery maps and a few other items that have been asked for. But we're looking for partnerships, um, you know, that will expand us in other areas, maybe an integration with um, art agencies or advertising agencies, maybe something that's actually aligned with our um, mission open education resources, education's primary, um, just showing that search that Microsoft helped prototype with us, that would be extraordinary to get into schools, especially in this period of time, or to collaborate with other collections. Yeah, great. We have one last question for Regina Jaslow. Uh, is the Met able to connect the dots as how having the CPI may have helped increase awareness of the Met? And maybe enhance donation or funding, right? Do you are are you able to link that yet or not yet? No, we we haven't been able to link that. Um, I I will say um, we don't know who's using our API because it is public. We didn't build in authentication for that. However, um, we love it when people contact us and tell us they're using it. So you should contact us. Um, we you know. We're a public institution. Um, of course, we want partnerships. Of course, we want people to, you know, donate money to us. That's great. But we're interested in making sure that we are meeting our mission of making our um, our our collection accessible. And just for the uh, the story, but one time I was uh, talking to the head of the Louvre Museum, you know, the French museum, and he told me why everybody see Mona Lisa, w comes to Paris to see Mona Lisa. Because they are, they have already seen it somewhere in a book or in Google Image mm -hmm. and stuff. So it seems you are doing the exact, the exact. You are doing this philosophy for the Met, and by the more you share about the Met picture, the more people will come to see the original art, right? There's, there's no question. How can you not fall in love with some of these items? We truly believe that we have a, something in our collection that will connect with every person on the planet that will inspire them. We truly believe that. So there's there's truly something for everyone and the more access they get, the better. I agree with you. I agree with you. And this is why we love to to have you to to tell the story about that. Thank uh, you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I think, uh, uh, yeah, Fran Romero from Am Amadeus will, will also join about building developer programs. Uh, yeah, so we, we can maybe wait 30 seconds for one more minute. Uh, you can deconnect your screen, Maria. Uh, it was great to have you uh, at the event. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Yeah, your passion is infectious. I totally agree. And we so Fran is in the backstage. Fran, Fran is coming on the stage. Hello, Francisco. I hope you're doing well. 
Hello, very good. And you? So to, today in, in, in my session, what I'm going to describe, what I'm going to talk about is about um, how to build a, a developer program in the context of a large corporation and already from the ground up, so meaning starting from the scratch. No, It's, a, it's not an easy topic and uh, it's something that uh, I have had the, the, the opportunity to do in the last years together with my team and uh, there were a lot of things that I learned and uh, for me it's, it's a pleasure to be able to share those, those learnings with you today. Right? So. Let's get into it. I think that the, the presentation will be interesting, not only for the ones who may have to go through that equivalent very soon, but also for the ones who may be going now through, through, through that in the middle of it, and also for the ones that may, uh, that may have done it and may be able to refer and compare uh, versus what, what I'm gonna share with you today. So who hasn't started, or if not, who will not face this kind of excuses or, uh, or uh, statements when they have to launch an, an API program in a large corporation, no, it's, it's very common to, to listen to this kind of excuses like uh, we don't have the right uh, the right budget for that. Uh, that's not the priority. We have other things to do. It's very difficult to start a program when you find these kind of excuses. No, so the the topic today will be how can we overcome many of the resistances that that we are gonna encounter no? in this kind of context and environment. So I will start by sharing only 30 seconds about uh, the company in which I work for and the industry. And the reason is because I'm going to refer to many examples about it so that you need to understand a little bit the context. So I work for Amadeus. I am the, the head of open innovation programs at Amadeus. Uh, Amadeus is an IT company that works in the travel industry. Uh, we share, we are in the middle, in the sweet spot between all the travel providers and all the travel subscribers, so meaning that we connect to airlines, hotels, car rentals, etc., and we distribute their content. We provide the, the technology to travel agencies around the world. We also provide technology for their reservation and inventory systems of the airlines, hospitality, etc. So we are a big player. We, last year, we processed almost 2 billion of passengers of airlines, more than 600 reservations. So as you can see, it's quite a big company within the travel industry. All right? And within this big industry that we are a big player, uh, we managed to, to launch a couple of years ago a new open innovation program, uh, which is uh, Amadeus for Developers, in which our intention is to help the, the innovators and the developers to build the future of travel. Right, so we will build a new program that I'm going to describe how we made it and how we made it accessible today and why it is being a success and how it is easy accessible in a matter of minutes and why there are many good things ongoing. All right? So now that we know uh, the, the, the context about the industry in which I'm going to give the examples and, and, and how everything started for us in the journey, so these are the areas that I would like to, to cover today. Number one is how can you overcome uh, competing priorities with other projects that your organization may be going through, right? All, all big organizations have many things ongoing. So how do you make your API program stand out out of the others, all right? The second one is about how can you navigate some advices about how to navigate some uh, corporate culture and structures that you may encounter. What things can you do to be able to make it easier, all right? The third one is about some uh, recommendations about how to address technology. It's a big topic when you are launching a program. So what are the things that we learned? And, and what would be our advice for that? The fourth one is about managing risk, both, <coughs> excuse me, both real and perceived, which are very different. And the fifth one is, once you launch, don't think that everything is done, because actually it will be just the beginning of another phase of the journey. And how can you survive? What would be the first baby steps of the new launch program? So if you are interested, let's go for it, and let's go through all these five blocks uh, together. All right, so let's say that you have to overcome which are the, the competing priorities, all right? Other programs that may be ongoing, no? So what do we recommend for this situation, especially when you when you start from the scratch, no? In my case, when I started, literally what I had was a, was a blank page, a blank PowerPoint, and I had to define pretty much everything with my team. So we started by something that sounds logical and simple, but in the end is where I'm gonna dedicate most of the time because it's the most important, which is how do you communicate the value and how can you make your program shine no? across all the others? No? So there are many projects out there. And why, will, why would your top management decide that your program is one of the top priorities among all the others? Eh? How do you make it stand out, right? All right? So they will tell you things like there is no budget, that is very uncertain, that there are many risks, uh, that uh, maybe the solution or the value that your program may bring to you is not going to be in the very, very short term, which is the, the top priority focus. So you have to build a, a value proposition that explains how to address all these areas and more, thinking more into the long term. So the recommendation here is to build a compelling case, and I'm going to share with you how we did it successfully and, and other ideas that we got from other cases. 
and be careful because I'm, I'm being very, very uh, exact with the words. I'm not saying to build a compelling business case. I'm saying to build a compelling value-based case. All right, it's, it's a bit different. I know I don't think that we should focus already from starting to purely the financials of the return of the investments because the value can come from many different ways. Some of them very easily manageable from the financial point of view, and others through different aspects. All right. So, first of all, uh, our advice is that you build something that provides the context of what does it mean to bring an API program into the organization. Right? And here, one of the best advices is to put it into the framework of the digital transformation, especially now that we are going through a specific tough times with, uh, uh, with after the COVID or during the COVID pandemic, and most of the companies have to reinvent or at least adapt to uh, new processes and new, and new requirements, right? The second one is clearly state which is the value of their APIs, uh, of the API program that you're going to set up, uh, both in revenues and beyond. And in the next slide, you will see which are those pockets of value that will make it stand out. And the third advice is also highlight the risk of not taking any action. This is very important because Sometimes not doing anything can represent a lot of risk or, or loss of opportunity. No? So also use that into your advantage for that. So let, let's get into some of them, some ideas. So first of all, always pitch the APIs whenever you can as something that can enable the change. And here one of the beauty for me of the, of the APIs is the fact that they can allow almost any kind of change. APIs, by definition, they are, they are agile, they are scalable, they can be used for almost anything that the developers can think of or the innovators. So this is the kind of thing that can make the organization change. And change is something that has to be there for organizations, whether you like it or not. Actually, if you don't change, it's when you are really in serious trouble. All right? So explain why the APIs change, produce, enable the change, and what are the, the, the benefits that they can bring to that change. There are some, some, some interesting quotes, for example, this one from Simon Sinek. So the ones that implement the change are the ones that will come stronger and reinvent. And actually, it's interesting some of the figures that we got from other sources, like Harvard, Actually, from the last three big crises, now that we are in the middle of one, 10% of the top companies managed to reinvent themselves and thrive through change. So that top 10% were not the ones who cost cut and who didn't think into the long-term future and strategy. They were the ones who knew what they had to do to change and to adapt. And APIs are precisely that, right? So focus into what are the enablers of this type of, of products and technologies. No? On top of that, if you want to bring into the revenue space, which I'm sure that you will be asked, you can cover the part of the revenue, which is uh, on average in the top leading IT companies, 30% of the revenues are brought either by directly by APIs or indirectly by APIs. This is another solid statement that you can bring. So if well done, they can, re they can bring a lot of significant revenue. And what about beyond revenue? Because it's very important to highlight not only that and not to focus only into the business case. So there are a whole lake of other pockets of opportunity that uh, have to be highlighted because they are probably in most cases even more important than the purely direct revenue that you will get in the short term. So things like the ones that we have written here in the slides, like the possibility to reach new customers of your existing products, uh, the things that are creating new partnerships, or uh, to be able to unlock new ideas, new products, or new business models. Right? All that list have specific values for the products. The, the idea is that you can identify the ones that can be more valuable for your specific company or industry and context and use those ones to the stakeholders that may be more interested into that. So if you think that the, the efficiency and automation part will be most interesting for your IT director, for example, raise it to them. And if you think that another one of the innovation head or the strategic growth units are interested in the innovation, explain to them how the APS can enable that. So look at that, those pockets of opportunities and translate how the APIs can help us to increase the value in those areas, all right? Uh, lastly, for this first uh, topic, um, we also found very useful the possibility to create a sense of audience, meaning that it's not okay to wait for, for developing API programs because it may be too late. Uh, like I said before, if you don't do anything, that is already taking a decision. So not doing anything is already deciding not to take an action. And there, you can highlight what will be the consequences of not doing that program. Uh, for example, you can take the information coming from the customers, the ones that may be demanding more agility to connect to you or to develop new solutions or to do new things that you don't offer today, but they are looking forward to get that, that previous level of functionalities to develop things on, on top of your solutions or on top of their solutions as well. So if the customers are demanding that, and usually they do, why not taking that, that, that information and showing it to your, to your management? The same goes for competitive. In our case, in Amadeus, we, we, we 
we are honest about it. We were not the first ones to, to create an open API program. And, and we used the information from the competition to, to, to explain to them what was out there in the market, what we thought was happening, what were the benefits that they were getting, and how we thought that not only we should be able to do the same, but even more, even better. In this case, we thought about not being the, the first ones as an, as an advantage in the sense of checking first what they have done, look at the things that they could, we could do better, and then come out to the market with something that would exceed our competitors. So it's true that we didn't have the first movers advantage, but if that happens, it's not the end of the world. Let's try to come back stronger by addressing what is out there in the market, in your industry, and then leveraging on those opportunities. So that was the, the first point about the, the, the value of the programs. It's probably the most important, again, uh, because if, if they don't understand it, they don't see it, they will not give you the green light to move on to the to the next phases, no? to, to start to develop the, the program. So what will happen if you already get the approval for for developing something like that, no? for launching a program? Well, in this case, you're going to encounter many other uh, barriers no? or difficulties. No? And one of them is the, is the corporate culture and the structure that, that you may find. Usually, large corporation, corporations are not do not have the optimum setup for developing this kind of programs. It's not, it's not bad, it's simply that they, they are not ready because they have never done it before. But it doesn't mean that it is the right one for developing something like that. So how can you propose to adapt or to evolve the teams and the governance required for making uh, that program a success? No? So the, the landscape that you will find at the beginning is very complex. In our case, it was in the sense that uh, they were ready for developing many things and for addressing each of the verticals of travel independently they were literally uh, thousands of APIs around the organization, but they were not prepared to expose them in an open environment in an easy accessible way, no? and mostly because of the setup and the, and the programs. No? So we found actually many scattered initiatives. Um, so again, many units in, in Amadeus had different uh, individual and private API programs, but none of them were shared and none of them were uh, ready to be exposed outside. Each of them had their own specific ownership, made total sense, and they're all resistant to change something, mostly because of the unknowns. So I'm going to talk later in another block about the, the risk and, the, and the, how to change that, that initial resistance. And equally important about the, the technology, what about the legacy systems in which they are, they are falling? No? So these areas can be uh, broken and adapted to be able to, to accept that, that there is a need to do it. So here comes the, the, the two main recommendations for this uh, block. The first one is work on a ring fence API team. So don't fall into the mistake of having a scattered team that works individually into different areas and they are not working uh, independently and solely focused into this new API program. If they do it, you will end up uh, mixing uh, and having problems with the priorities by not having everybody working on the same topic at the same time. It has to be everybody focused and with a real fence. Don't allow anybody else to, mer to, to mess around with the budget, with the resources, with the focus, it will not fly otherwise. So secure that you ring fence your team to do that. And the second one is you can have your own governance, define it, and do it in an open and transparent way. Why? Because then you will get the buy-in from the stakeholders of the other programs that they will have to help you to make it a reality. Tell them that they are going to have visibility. Tell them that you are, they are going to have a saying into what you're going to do and how they're going to do it. And then you will be able not only to make them a part of your potential resistance, but actually one of the supporters of your program, all right? So for the ring fence team, uh, what we did in our case, and it's something that we also recommend, is find uh, people from different units that they are totally committed and mix them so that they can have an overall 360 overview. So whether they are people from a strategy, from program management, obviously from product and for technology, and super important, the DevRel team and, and, and marketing, no? They are the, the teams of the of bringing the solutions to the developers and the innovators, right? So build these multitasking uh, teams and make them work together. That's for the first advice. And for the second one on the governance, so I would like to share with you what we did uh, at Amadeus. So we started by having a, a program uh, coordinated uh, between uh, corporate strategy, which is where, where, uh, where we worked at the time, and, and sharing that governance across all the different units in Amadeus. There was a platform that was built almost from the scratch, leveraging on other modules. I'll come back into the technology a bit later, technology section. But we built a common platform for maintaining and, and, and creating a roadmap of all the new APIs. And we had our product managers coming from all the business units that could contribute with them. We had a centralized committee for the data. 
so that they could analyze from a transversal point of view the different risks, the types of data, uh, which were the ones that were easily, uh, more easily to be exposed, which ones we couldn't be able to make it. So all the data experts, legal people looking, security people looking into how to expose that data. And then finally the design. No? So we were following some common guidelines uh, created by the experts of the API community, right? They are the ones who are gonna consume uh, the, the, the solution. So they have to tell us how to do it no? in, in, the, in the optimum way, right? All right, so those were the, the, the two first focus. Let's look into the third one, which is actually how to address the, the question on, on, on technology, which is uh, you may encounter that at the beginning, uh, you have several uh, technologies going around the different parts of the programs. How do you encounter them? How do you put them together? So here we have a simple recommendation based on three, on three, three main pillars. Number one, treat it as a puzzle. So go piece by piece. Don't think about building something that will cover absolutely all the use cases and all the potential evolution in the future. That would take too long. So start by thinking the pieces, and when you have a basic structure, go for it. And the first recommendation here is rely, ideally, into some of the API management solutions. Why? Because if not, you will have to start to build one, and that is something extremely complicated. And personally, I think that it wouldn't make sense when there are the other players that provide fantastic solutions, and you can just literally take them. They are not expensive at all. You can adjust what are the parts that you need and the parts that you don't need and rely on that architectural structure to start with your program, all right? In my case, there are many providers out there. Uh, you, you can research uh, by yourself. You can look into some uh, magic quadrants, for example, of Garner. There are many studies. Uh, most of them are very, very good. Some of them are niche, others are generic, others are more uh, thinking forward, more, more visionaries. Uh, you can have uh, APG, uh, Musoft. There are many out there. You know? so in our case, we chose APG, but for other reasons, uh, it doesn't mean that it's just the only one out there. There are other options, right? So that will uh, allow you to go faster and to rely on some experience and a good architecture. The second one is define which how you want to fill that architecture. De define which are the best technologies that you want to expose to your organization. In our case, for example, we decide to base everything into REST JSON APIs. That technology will probably ease a lot of the adoption instead of just using SOAP XML or other kind of technologies that may not be so so easily adopted, right? So define how you want to fill up. And the last one is think about if and start with the scalability in your mind, meaning that don't cover everything, start with some minimum uh, viable product at the beginning, and then later on with time, you can add other modules to uh, unlock more use cases and more functionalities from the platforms and from the APIs. Number four is about managing risk. So uh, how, do you, how do you stay ahead with the, with the, the the concerns that the business units and the, and the other stakeholders from the programs may bring to you, no? In most cases, they are real. In others, it's perceived, and all of them are valid. Don't get me wrong. If I were one of those stakeholders or, or owners of other business units, I would have the same concern. So they are important and they have to be there. But here, the approach that we propose is the following. is um, If you hear for things like, like uh, there is a risk of cannibalization or legal risk, that is very valid. You will have to address them, all right? If there are security concerns like attacks or what about sensitive data, the same. It's impossible to go out with a, with a new program without addressing those ones. Or finally, about the performance. What about how do you accommodate the scalability for large uh, volume? So how do you tackle these areas that, are, that we have selected as examples? So first of all, try to manage all the risk from the start. Don't wait, ideally, until they come back to you with the questions. If you already think about it beforehand, or even better, if you get engaged with those stakeholders from the start to tell them, let's work on those risks before they are even a reality or before you can even, even raise them across other stakeholders so that you can tell me how and what are those risks. We can work together on how to mitigate them or remove them and then uh, already put it in place from the start. That is a key advantage for all these kind of products because they will see you as a partner instead of someone, someone that is trying to bring a, a, something unknown no, into the organization. Be transparent. And then the same advice this is, this is always useful. Start small, and if there is something that you cannot tackle, leave it, leave it for later in a, in a phase approach, all right? In our case, I mentioned before that, that we did with Amadeus for developers, we launched an MVP. We, we did it a couple of years ago. We started with a small limited set of, of just 10 APIs. They were get APIs only, and we even went to, to very complex APIs and with low risk data. Once we proved that it worked, everybody saw that, that, that it was in the right direction. And it was much, much easier to make it from the end to make it more complex. I will, I will explain to you how we evolved the program also in a minute. All right. Fantastic. 
So uh, the, the last block, the number five area that I would like to cover is how do you do after you launch the program? You may think that you have done the tough work, but to me it's actually just another phase. No? It's actually very tricky to control the, the excitement when you launch, when you start to, to be able to see the value coming into the organization, but actually the, the, real, the real situation or the real uh, scenario starts there because you start to have real customers, they have always very high expectations, and you have to deliver the best to your customers and your consumers. So how do you survive not falling into, into, um, into a stagger or, or into a very simple approach to APIs, thinking that you have done most of the work? And how do you keep up with the phase of bringing more value and, and to be able to maximize the value that both the users and you can bring to each other? No? So here there are all the three pillars that I would like to share with you. The number one is from day one, please, Treat the users as the new kings. Why? Because you have to define everything about your organization, your setup, your DevRel team, your product, etc., into what those users are going to tell you. Actually, they are the, the whole focus into the users is, is, is what is going to give you the real uh, channel and feedback, the real direction about the how to go. So I'm now moving from, from the first one to the second one, no? which is the real compass is going to be coming from the feedback from the users and at the same time for how you measure that feedback plus other KPIs. How do you define those KPIs? Well, the, here the recommendation, and this is also standard from all industries, is that you define a funnel KPI approach. What is a funnel KPI? You may have, uh, you may think about the, the onboarding process into your program as a funnel, right? So many people may, may, may find you from different channels. That is already one KPI. Some of them may enter into your portal, may not register because they may not like it. So there is a channel out they leave and others may register. So the, the base that will register will be a bit smaller versus the ones that found your, your program. No? What about the ones that register? Some of them may start to consume some of their APIs in test and others not. So a smaller production. And some of those may move to production and others may develop new things. So it will take time, but think about it as a funnel in which you can track what are the percentages in between one and another. And that will be very useful to understand where the funnel is not working seamless or flawless and what you have to put more resources to improve things like the portal, the product, uh, the, the explanation of, of the value, and uh, how to move faster to, to test or to productions, uh, the contracts. Ask the users. They will tell you how to do it. So the answers will be coming from them. And the third one is <coughs> iterate from there. That, that's, that's fantastic because now you have a compass. Up until now, you may have been guessing or you may have been uh, being directed by the, by the experts or by advices from other people that have done it. But in, your company at the end of the day should be unique in some way, and you should think about um, elements that will make it stand out from your competitors. So when you start, go for it. In our case, what did we do? After we proved that the point at the beginning, we evolved the program. We came up with many more APIs. Now we have more than 25. Uh, and we also make them more complex, even including, for example, some artificial intelligence APIs, which are very cool for, for innovation ideas. No? So the APIs also become more, more complex, including uh, post capabilities, the platform became more complex with more capabilities, and so it was much more uh, complete, no? and, and therefore we were uh, enhancing the value. Okay. All right, so those were the, the, the five blocks I wanted to, to talk to you about today. Um, I wanted to share with you some other ideas that came out in the travel industry, thanks to the, to the program. So yeah, Fran, you have, you have uh, one more minute. To Very actually. good. Very good. So, uh, remember the first slide about the values? Well, at the end of the day, we could prove that they end up coming up. So we, we, today, we are now much more connected to the innovation ecosystem. Uh, we could find a much more adoption to a lot of our data and functionalities. Uh, there was uh, efficiencies uh, in our APIs, in our web services. We have many more new solutions. And another thing that we found very interesting, we are now very, very well connected to new emerging trends. So because the, the market is they are demanding what to do with your data, you may be able to be very fast at det detecting what to do uh, with your data and what they are demanding to you. Now, for example, with the COVID situation, we have a very good uh, radar about how they are the new solutions have been developed to try to tackle uh, the new landscape. All right. So this is the last slide. Uh, it's a recap in case you, you want to have it about the key points of the five blocks that I have explained. So I'm not going to cover them again, but remember, so value, team and governance, address the tech puzzle, minimize the risk, whether it is perceived or real, and then take it a step by step into the, into the right evolution that it will be demanded. 
And if you have any problem or any question, please ask the API these communities because we are all here to, to assist you. We are a fantastic uh, group of, of uh, friends and, and trying to help each other. So it's always a pleasure to, to come with you and, and uh, I will keep always relying on this community because it's, it's fantastic. I would like to thank you very much for, for, for allowing the opportunity to, to share these insights with you. I'm very happy to, to share with you more information or answer any question. Yeah, thank you very much, Fran. And I know that Amadeus team is uh, is, uh, is really involved and, and really community driven. Uh, I think all the questions you answered them, it was mostly about KPIs, but you talk about it. And so because of time, and I'm really glad, we're really glad to have you uh, done your talk here. Uh, we will host uh, Sophia Rutar uh, right now for uh, the, which is head of, e who is uh, head of APIs at the uh, Euler Hermes and who will talk about uh, security and zero trust and how they do it at Euler Hermes. So uh, thank you very much, Fran, and let's have um, Sophie on stage. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Sophie, uh, calling in from Berlin in Germany. Happy to be here. And sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, so I'm going to talk about zero trust security in APIs. And I loved, and I, the first thing I thought about was uh, Spy vs. Toy. For those who know it, fabulous comic. Um, yeah. To jump in, um, I'm working for Euler Hermes as head of API, so I have the um, API governance, API developer relations, all this stuff. And um, for those who don't know Euler Hermes, we are a company that exists like for more than 100 years. So we're coming from this time where um, insurance looked like this, these oak desks and paper stuff and everything. Um, of course, the world has changed ever since. And that's a good thing. So um, I will quickly um, talk about what we are doing because it will help you better understand why APIs are important for us. I try to be quick and not to, to bore you with it. So um, let's imagine there's two companies trading with each other. So the left company is selling goods to the right one, or there goes a little ship goes there and an invoice goes with it. And then it takes a little time, maybe 60 to 90 days in business, that's normal. And then the invoice is being paid and everybody's happy. But let's imagine um, that little ship goes again and the invoice comes again and then it takes a little time and it takes a little more time. And uh, ooh, unfortunately, um, right company went bankrupt before they could pay their invoice and now Unfortunately, the money is gone for the left company, and that can be a very difficult situation. And this is actually what we ensure. And uh, so in this case, uh, we would then pay left company, and there would not be a problem. Um, nice so far. Um, of course, left company has more than just one customers, and then we would secure all these customer relationships individually. And then when you look at this in a more global context, then you see millions of transactions going on worldwide, companies trading with each other in need of security. And there's also some other market players like marketplaces, brokers, and such, which we can partner up with. And there you, you get the big picture. And of course, you can imagine that um, for the sheer volume of transactions to be insured, the old oak Wood desk is not the appropriate medium anymore. Um, we need to have APIs. And that's why insurance looks more like this today. Um, this is our brand new developer portal um, that we built. Um, by the way, thank you to Chris from Prodavex. They helped us um, tremendously. I'm super happy with that. Okay, but uh, the talk is about zero trust and um, now, you may ask yourself, why zero trust? IT security was managed for ages. Why do we need something new? Um, well, here's why. Um, IT security for in the, in the past looked pretty much like this, uh, like a fortress with like high walls, thick walls, and then there's this steep um, um, spacing between the public and the, the fortress. Uh, maybe it could be filled with water and sharks inside it super secure, nobody can enter, um, except uh, through the one entry gate, which can even be pulled up to isolate everything to be super secure. 
which is um, quite nice if you have this um, monolith architecture and if you work essentially to do things internally in your castle. And I would consider it a bit like a, a marketplace that you find inside the, the fortress, which means that once you're in and you made it through this entry gate and everything, and you find this marketplace where you have pretty much access to the platforms which are interfaced with technical users. Uh, so once you can access one platform, then you basically get all the information also from the others because you're considered trusted um, because you're inside. Um, and then over time, um, some additional things needed to be do done. So you could not just stay in your castle. You had to build an online portal. So you had to dig a little hole in the wall to connect your online portal for the outside world super secure still with IP whitelisting and the likes. Um, yeah, but yeah, that wasn't really made for collaboration and microservices. And if you now look at a new architecture where the monoliths would be replaced by microservices, um, already you get more complexity in the connections in, inside the castle, of course. Um, you need to, to give the, the access to your portal to all those microservices. And, and then again, microservices are built for collaboration and not, not just to stay inside the castle. So you need to build plenty of holes in your security wall to let people connect to your microservices. And then especially if your partners, they are on the cloud, then uh, they will ask you to grant um, wide ranges of IP addresses. And basically, the protection of your famous fortress is not usable anymore. It goes bust. Uh, so that's a shame for, for this nice castle that we don't have anymore. Instead, what we get is uh, what we call the zero trust architecture. And what it means actually is that at each API calls, you need to check at four levels. Um, First one being very basic check, the, the web application filter, the WAF, and I love this WAF expression. Um, that's of course very simple um, checks on the, on the API gateway level to just prevent from people spamming you or denial of service attacks, all this kind of stuff, pretty basic. Uh, next, you need to identify who is that person calling your microservice. You need to do that securely. Um, then you need to check the authorizations for that person. If it's he or she allowed to do what she um, wants to do. And finally, you also have functional checks, which are more at the microservice level. And um, these are more business related checks. For example, if um, the user requests to do an action on a product, that doesn't suit that product, you need to also refuse that, um, that request. Um, so, and then what I'm gonna um, deep dive is what I call the fun stuff because it's a bit more complex to, to implement, which is uh, the ID checks and the authorizations stuff. So um, looking into the ID checks, um, let's imagine we have our nice um, microservices, four of them here, and we want to connect them to the outside world because that's what they are built for. So in a classical scenario, and that what we originally thought of, probably we would just take an API management. It's like the, the box that does everything and um, have the APIs connect through that to the outside world and they will be secure. It will be easy to do and that's nice. However, um, as we're not only doing API-based uh, interaction with partners, there's also an online portal, um, which is then used by the same customers. It brings in its own user credentials management and it will connect to the same microservice, but maybe not necessarily through the API management tool because we don't want to pay at each transaction the license fees. 
Um, and we can do that because the online portal is what we would build ourselves in our protected private cloud. We could do that. And we could do likewise for the inside application, our internal tools. We could do all that. Um, thing is that unfortunately this would pretty much resemble to the, the castle that we just destroyed and we don't want to get back to this anymore. Um, what we wanted to do is, um, yeah, basically, first of all, we wanted to open source. That's a different thing. Um, we wanted to clearly know who is calling our microservices at any point in time. And also we wanted to have one approach that fits all. So we don't really want to have this technical differentiation between internal and external user management um, because we believe we don't need it. So if we now have the, the uh, microservice, we want to connect them to the outside world. Um, as we happen to use Amazon Web Service, um, so we do have the, the gateway that comes with these um, services, so we can just use that. And then when we create our online portal for our customers, we don't really create a, a, an application of portal like we did in the past. We basically just build screens that um, visualize what you find in the microservice in terms of functionality. And uh, we can do that in different functional ways. So we do the same for the developer portal. And also we do the same for the internal application. And that's the, the main difference. Basically we treat all users, all applications in the same way um, on the cloud, public cloud outside. Um, of course we need to secure that. And um, we chose, because we wanted an open source solution, we chose uh, WSO2 to do that, the ID server. Meaning um, that whenever somebody is calling, we will check the ID on this tool. Now, there's one thing that we um, added that we said to ourselves, it's nice to have a technical ID for all your users, but it's even nicer if you link that technical ID with an internal um, user identification process. So we uh, federated with our Active Director, which, which is managing the, managing the internal users, the, the staff of Euler Hermes, um, going through an HR process so we really know who they are. And um, we do the same for our customers and partners where we use Salesforce. And so uh, you have a, a KYC process to, to know whom you're actually dealing with. And this is, of course, not just an inside out thing where we do uh, the process manually inside your Hermes and then, you know, those users. It can as well be triggered from the outside. So, for example, when you create uh, a login on our developer portal, what's going to happen is that it calls an API, the, the create user API, which will feed into the KYC process before then creating the contact and the ID on the ID server. And by doing that, we are safe that whoever is calling an API, we know who that is, and we know he or she is uh, securely identified. Um, one other important thing at this level is uh, roles. So we are not just managing identities, but we're also giving roles to those identities. So as an example, um, an internal staff would have the role internal, very creative, and um, that would allow to access all our microservices. Probably, maybe not in this example. Um, another role would be for our API developer, for example. Uh, in that case, we would allow the creation of an API key, that service, but not the other ones. Or you can have a, a customer role. And in this case, you have uh, the other three microservices. You get the picture. And of course, a user can evolve from one role to another. 
um, if there's a business reason to do so. And uh, so this gives us a first level of security um, for our zero trust infrastructure. Nice. The next challenge is um, authorizations then. And um, I try to visualize why it is a complex thing. Um, authorizations will depend on the business that you run. They can be very different. In our case, it's typically contracts. You have one or several insurance contracts um, that you signed. And if you use our products, you're authorized to use those. Okay, so good so far. Um, of course, in the contracts, there might be different features and we might want to authorize not the total package, but on each feature. Or um, when we do that, we might also authorize somewhere between read, write, or both, or even admin rights. Um, well, the contracts in our case, they are in hierarchies. So you need to understand that hierarchy to, to authorize, for example, on hierarchy one, and then you get contracts one and two, and you can see all of them. Um, yeah, and, but, but if you do that, of course, there's also exceptions. And you see the, the complexity is continuously growing. And, and what I show here is just very high level. The reality of our authorization system is it's much more complex than what I have, um, what I could put on, on such a slide. And um, that's why we, we have created this kind of architecture. So when, when the API call is coming from the customer portal, he did uh, uh, an action on the portal. The API is calling um, to the gateway. We check the identity. Um, so we say, yes, you can call that microservice for the feature that you wanted to use. Now, the microservice will call, um, just have a check if to see if the, if the token is valid. That's a pretty um, technical thing. And then the microservice need to run through those um, authorizations and understand, is that user allowed to do what he wants to do? And we, we find that, uh, of course, if we let the microservice crawl all that information, it will be a lot of um, complexity to be implemented. So we um, package it in, in an application that we call the resource manager because authorizations can be um, managed on all kinds of resources. Um, and it will only say yes and no to the microservice. And that makes this uh, thing much simpler. The microservice is saying, okay, that customer wants to um, ask for credit limit coverage. Is he allowed to do that? And resource managers say, yes, we can do that. And um, to, to do that, the resource manager has a database where all the authorizations are documented. And for performance reasons, there's also a denormalized um, variant of that. Um, because we need to be really fast in responding to that um, inquiry. Yeah, and, and that's about it for that second challenge. Um, and Sophie, yeah, we, we need to wrap up. So if you can, uh, you know, make the third challenge uh, as a conclusion. Please. Oh, oh, sorry to hear that. Okay, um, so um, I need to then click more rapidly um, just to say, the, the good thing is if you attack one microservice, you don't get it all. And the same goes for the bottle because you're only authorized to, to um, individual resources. Um, you need to look at performance because you create a single point of failure. So this must be super scalable and everything. Um, you need to be flexible in the roles that you create to not uh, block your business. Uh, you need to do governance to control that. So automation is key in deploying your APIs with that security framework. Um, but what you get is then simplification. So it's very easy to connect your APIs to that framework. Um, you have full auditability on your um, infrastructure and um, you're cleaning up your data. So you have no redundancy in your users. Sorry, Danny. 
um, you have a clearer, um, cleaned up picture on your data, so you don't get the mess that you have in your legacy already today. And finally, if you revoke an account, well, then the user is completely blocked and you're secure that he cannot do any activities anymore. Thank you. That was the speed version. Thank you very much, Sophie. We go on the break for that time. You can do what you want or network or going to the expo. Well, back in eight minutes. Thank you very much, Sophie. Thank you. Bye. Bye.